All right. Well, good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on their computer. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done by using the menu panel and the menu on your screen. Go to view and then select full screen. We do estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take approximately one hour. We welcome your questions. You can submit them to us via email, questions at WLL.com. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Greg Schumach, Senior TCB Reviewer, is a veteran of the wireless regulatory industry, serving for a dozen years at the Equipment Authorization Branch at the Federal Communications Commission. Greg has reviewed thousands of devices for compliance with the FCC and ICIT Canada rules and is on the Board of Directors of the Telecommunication Certification Body Council, TCBC. Greg has given lectures, sermons, and presentations for a variety of audience and continues to tackle complex device applications. So, without further ado, Let's turn our attention to preparing certification applications for radio approvals with Greg Schumach. Hi, Greg. How are you today? I'm doing thank uh, great. Thank you, Kim. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. It's all yours. Thank you much. I'll start to share my content. And, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, who is listening in. I suspect uh, at least a few of us here listening into this right now are um, – listening from home, because that's where a lot of us have been doing a lot of our work recently. It's been strange times in a lot of places, not just here in the U.S., but everywhere in the world, I think. It's a kind of a wake-up call and a welcome to the 21st century, if you will. However, on the plus side, working at home sometimes does give us a little bit more time to put things together and work on the things that we need to work on and concentrate on. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, the preparation of applications for equipment authorization, in order to get certification uh, through either the FCC or IC, also known as ICED uh, in Canada, it's I-S-E-D as well. They've kind of got a halfway name change going on at this time. Uh, so uh, this, this particular um, presentation is going to be a pretty basic level on the required elements of a certification application that you would submit to a TCB for FCC authorization or to a CB for ICED authorization in the U.S. or Canada. Uh, we'll be going through the details of, of the requirements in these applications uh, over the next hour or so. Um, basically, uh, I guess also just to give you a very brief background about myself, as Kim had mentioned, I actually started out, I've been in this business for more years than I care to remember. I started out in the FCC directly out of college back in 87. I went to the FCC laboratory in 89 and started working on equipment authorizations at that time where I was involved in a lot of testing. I helped develop test procedures, worked on rulemakings, uh, and, and did a lot of testing for and, and review of equipment authorization applications. In 2000, when the FCC privatized the entire function of equipment authorization and created the TCB uh, Council and the various TCBs and the organizations in order to take over this work, uh, under the authority of the FCC. Uh, I left the FCC at that point uh, and have worked for a couple of different TCBs since that time, uh, been actively involved in the community since its inception back in 2000. I am currently uh, serving on the TCB Council Board of Directors as well. Uh, for the last five plus years, I have been a, a senior review engineer here at American Certification Body, ACB. Um, and. Uh, that's where I am today. So I've uh, been doing this stuff for, like I said, more years than I care to remember. So 
getting into it. Your testing has been completed on the device that you are so proud of and ready to market and, 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 and sell to the world. You have to apply for a certification, hopefully, of course, to, to ACB. Um, the manufacturer or the applicant may create the application. They oftentimes will ask the test lab to act as an agent for them to help them in that regard because many of the labs are, are, are very familiar with this process. And, and just from the very beginning, I, I'm going to make one, one point clear. Uh, you see there I mentioned manufacturer slash applicant. Uh, in many situations, those terms will be synonymous. Uh, but there are a few specific places where, from a legal perspective, the way the FCC rules are written, the word is applicant. And the applicant or the grantee of a particular grant uh, is legally responsible. And that might or might not be the manufacturer. The manufacturer might be manufacturing the device on behalf of the grantee or the applicant. And so uh, generally those terms will be synonymous, but it, there are situations where they're not. So I wanted to mention that up front. Um, when you uh, are ready then to submit your application to a TCB and, and all certification is performed by the TCBs on behalf of the FCC, nothing goes uh, directly to the FCC. It always must go to a TCB first. Uh, there's uh, several dozen TCBs located in the United States and around the world that have been qualified to do this particular work. That's a 17065 accreditation uh, and a 17025 accreditation that we are required to have. So you're ready to put together your application and these different documents that have to be included are called exhibits. And that's primarily what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, we'll start out by looking at the U.S. and the U.S. requirements, of course, uh, specified by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. So you've got an equipment authorization application that you're getting ready to submit to the TCB. Uh, this application is going to consist of various things like application forms, technical documents, test reports, photos, cover letters, users' manuals, installation guides, attestations, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, it's important to realize that, that many of these are indeed technical exhibits. There's a lot of technical information that has to be provided about your particular device and the way that it operates. Um, the application must actually describe the device. And, and when I say that, what I mean is this. Uh, it, it could be that your device has a, has a radio transmitter in it. And technically, it is because of that transmitter that your device is required to obtain certification. Uh, when you submit the application, though, I don't want you to ignore what your device is and simply talk about the transmitter. It's important for us to also realize what the overall function of the device is in which the transmitter is located, because that gives us an idea then of, of various usage conditions and configurations that are applicable to a lot of the different testing and, and uh, compliance requirements. And so the application should describe not only the radio in your device, for example, but actually what your device is and what it does. Uh, if you go and look on the FCC website, uh, and I'll talk about this later, but uh, you can uh, access a lot of information about existing uh, applications that have been granted on the FCC website. And if you look there, you'll, you'll note that a lot of the applications do not have this level of, of uh, uh, detail describing what the device is. Uh, TCBs will sometimes allow that to happen. However, it's been my experience over the years that the FCC, if they audit it, will always go back and require additional information as well as addressing any other deficiencies that, it, that they might see. While the TCBs do issue all of the grants, the FCC audits a certain percentage of those. They don't have the manpower to audit all of them, but they do audit a certain percentage of those, and we'll go back after the fact and ask for corrections to, to potentially be made if necessary. Uh, so the, the, your best bet in general is to basically provide all the information that the FCC is asking for right up front. And if you do that, it reduces a lot of time and effort going back and forth and trying to get more information out of you so that the TCB can adequately uh, review the application. So now we're going to go into, as I said, some detail about exactly what those exhibits are that have to be provided. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the quality that the FCC requires regarding those exhibits, the amount of information that actually must be uh, provided. Excuse me, a swallow of water. Okay, the first thing that you have to fill out is the FCC Form 731. 731 form is required for all certification applications. 
Uh, note that when you fill out this form, it's not one of the documents that will be like in PDF form, for example, uploaded to the FCC website by the TCB. Uh, rather, the TCB has to take the information from the FCC form and manually upload that into the, F uh, uh, into the uh, FCC's database in order to create the application. So uh, still, it's very important that the Form 731 and all the information on it is, is complete and correct because the application in the FCC's database will be created by the TCB based on the information that you provide in that form. Uh, it's got to have the applicant's name, uh, the contact name, addresses, uh, mailing addresses, the FRN, that's the federal registration number that, that is uh, assigned to uh, everybody who applies for one with the FCC. The 731 will indicate the FCC ID number of the device being certified. The ID number is composed of two parts. The first three or five characters will be the grantee code, and after that, the, the, which will be specific for each individual company. Then the product code, which is specific and unique uh, and created by the company to describe that particular product. And we'll talk about some of these requirements uh, a few slides uh, down the road here. Uh, you're also going to need to provide a very brief description of the device. The examples are hub, rain sensor. It's, it's sometimes helpful to say something like um, maybe 802.11 hub or rain sensor with Wi-Fi. And that, that's a useful thing. What we do not need for the description of the device is an entire sentence. Uh, what we're not, we definitely do not want you to put something like, our device is capable of many different functions and can do this, that, and the other. And that's really not what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a phrase, a few words that will be able to, to describe the device in a very general manner. Uh, and that is actually what's going to be printed on the grant of authorization uh, to help describe the device. Uh, additionally, you'll have to fill out some of the technical information regarding the uh, frequencies, the output power, the rule parts, uh, perhaps the uh, frequency tolerance, things of that nature. Uh, and then finally, the applicant must sign the form, and it has to be a real signature on there. It can't be just a typed-in type of signature. Uh, <clears throat> going into a little bit of a detail on the FCC ID number, every product that gets certified must have its own unique FCC ID number, and then all of the identical products that you market would bear that same FCC ID number. Uh, the rule parts that I specify here, 2.925 and 2.926, define the way the FCT, FCC ID is, com how it's comprised, how it must be formatted, uh, it must be put on a device, it tells you where it can be put on the device, the fact that it must be something that's permanently put on the device. If it's on a label, the label must be expected to last the lifetime of the device. The ID number itself, where it says FCC ID colon, and then the ID number, must all be on a single line and can't be split up into multiple lines. All of these requirements are, are specified in those uh, particular rule sections there that you can uh, reference. I think at the end of this document here, I've got links to the various rule sections that you'll be able to uh, uh, go on and take a look at if you're not already familiar with them. The next thing that you're going to have to fill out on the FCC Form 731 is the equipment class. And uh, the FCC assigns and creates different equipment classes, which is a three-letter code, basically, uh, to the different types of technologies, uses, uh, and bands that are used. Uh, originally, the equipment classes uh, were, were based on the sections in the particular rule part uh, in, in which it was describing. So, for example, something that a lot of people know is a, a JBC is the equipment class for a personal computer, a class B personal computer. Originally, it came from the fact that uh, computers were covered in subpart J of part 15. So that was the J. The B was for class B versus class A, and then the C stood for computer, JBC. Um, DXT was a subpart D uh, transceiver, XT. Uh, so that's where a lot of the early uh, equipment classes came from. But over the years, there have been a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, revisions to the rules, changes to those equipment classes, and so long th those, those equipment classes are no longer intuitive. You, you can't really look at them and decide what they apply to because too many changes have been made. Uh, there is a list that the FCC provides of those, and I have a, a link to that in, in, in slides uh, later in this presentation as well. Uh, it's important to realize, though, that one your device might incorporate more than one equipment class. 
An equipment class might be a DTS, which is used under 15247 for, uh, for example, spread spectrum or digital uh, transmission systems like Wi-Fi. But if your device also has a Bluetooth hopping uh, transmitter in it that hops about in, st in a typical Bluetooth manner, uh, that would be a DSS. Uh, so you might have both a DTS and a DSS uh, in one device. You, you might have additional things. It might also be a computer peripheral, so it might also be a JBP on top of that. Uh, the FCC defines these types of, of equipment as composite devices. A composite device is a device that has more than one equipment class associated with it. In your application, you have to address all of these different types of, of, of equipment classes. Uh, many of the exhibits will apply to all of the equipment classes, but a separate test report is required for each different equipment class, and that's an important point to remember. Uh, and finally, the FCC is currently in the midst of revamping their equipment authorization system and, and their upload, uh, uh, document upload system. They're planning on having that change implemented, they think maybe late this year, early next year, uh, at which point uh, many of these equipment classes will, will, will go away. You will know, well, they'll still be there, but you will no longer be required to have a separate grant issued for each uh, the way it currently is. So here I just have a list of uh, different equipment classes. Uh, there's the link uh, that you can see to the FCC website that shows the equipment classes and the rule parts to which, uh, with which they're associated. Here are some examples that you can see on here for some uh, standard types of technologies and the equipment classes that are associated with them. And when you get a copy of this uh, presentation, you'll be able to look at this in some detail. The next thing in the Form 731 you're gonna to have to address is uh, confidentiality. Uh, the U United States has a Freedom of Information Act and the FOIA is an extremely powerful piece of legislation. It's also rather unique. I'm not aware of any other country actually, <clears throat> excuse me, in the world that has something similar, but basically, what this says is anything that a company submits to the federal government about, about their device, other than highly proprietary information, like schematics or operation detailed operational descriptions or parts lists, but things like test reports, photographs, label information, user's manual, all of that information must be publicly available on the FCC website. And this is because of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so when we submit, when a TCB uploads an application to the FCC site in the process of issuing that grant, many of those documents are going to be publicly available. Uh, the positive side, of course, is you can go on the FCC website and look at all of your competitors' documents that are not proprietary to them, test reports, users' manuals, photographs, and things of that nature. Uh, the downside is they can do the same to your equipment as well. Uh, so to protect uh, the proprietary information, you can uh, request that certain documents be afforded confidential treatment. This is a long-term confidentiality. This is something that would be proprietary, like block, block diagrams, operational descriptions, tune-up procedures, and the like. Um, certain other things, not all, but certain things can also be afforded confidentiality. Internal photos can be afforded confidentiality, but only if the public could never actually see the inside of your device. So they can go to the store and buy your device and open it up and look at it. Well, that's not a, a, a private thing. And so those internal photos would have to be on the public site. But if, you're, if you've taken and, and, and potted your PC boards with resin and coated them with resin so that the components cannot be seen and you would have to actually destroy the board in an effort to try and get through the resin to see the components, well, if you've gone to those lengths to protect the, the appearance of your PC board, then in that particular case, you could get permanent confidentiality granted for those internal photos. Uh, another example is if your device is in a place that is not accessible to the public. Uh, it's mounted on a tower, you know, 50, 50 yards over the ground somewhere, and no one in the public ever gets near the device. In a situation like that, if it can be documented, then in those cases, something like internal photos could also be held confidential. Uh, same with the user's manual. In order to hold that confidential, you would have to prove that you have a non-disclosure agreement in place with whoever you sell it to, that in which it states that they are not permitted to, to make that information public, uh, publicly available either. 
Another option that the FCC offers is something called short-term confidentiality. This is on certain types of exhibits, primarily photographs in the user's manual, that keeps them from being in the public file from the time the device is granted up until the time the device is marketed. Many times people will get a grant of equipment authorization, but they're not ready to start marketing the device for some months afterwards, and they don't want all the information about their device available to the public before they've begun to market it. So the FCC does permit certain additional exhibits, as I said, photographs and user's manuals, to be held short ter under short-term confidentiality. The limit, the absolute limit on that is 180 days, but technically the minute you start to market your device, offer it for sale and sell it, at that point the short-term confidentiality is over and things like photographs and user's manuals will go uh, onto the public website as well. Um, a couple of things that can never be held confidential, either short-term or long-term, are test reports and labels. And, and those, those are particular documents that the FCC has said, said must always be publicly available. Uh, this whole idea of short-term confidentiality does uh, involve some extra processes on the part of the TCB. Uh, and you have to inform the TCB, who then informs the FCC when the device begins to be marketed so that the short-term confidentiality uh, can be uh, lifted if it's before the expiration date. Uh, an application will also require a number of cover letters. These will include the confidentiality request letter that we were just talking about, clearly listing the documents that you want to held confidential or short-term short confidential, uh, and if it, in the case of short-term confidentiality, the requested length of that short-term confidentiality. Uh, you will also need an authorization letter if somebody other than the applicant is submitting the application or has signed any of the other documentation. Uh, when, you, when an applicant creates or registers for the very first time with the FCC and obtains their grantee code, uh, at that point they have to provide the FCC with a name and contact information for a point of contact associated with that grantee code for the, for the company. The FCC expects to see that point of contact signature on all of these official documents. If somebody else, like an agent, is signing the documents, then you must have a letter signed still by that point of contact in which they authorize other people by name to sign uh, documentation for the FCC application in their behalf. Uh, this is something the FCC is uh, uh, very clear about, and they're kind of sticklers about this because it gets into legal requirements and things of that nature. And, you know, you always, <laughs> you, if you want things to go quickly, you want to keep the lawyers out of the equation for as long as possible. So uh, it's better off just being very careful in these things and dotting your I's and crossing your T's, and then there's generally smooth sailing after that. Um, some of the other types of letters that might be uh, required in a particular equipment authorization application are listed here. If you're applying for a modular approval, there's a special form for that. Permissive change letters, class two permissive change letters, explanations, uh, justifications for data reuse, various types of attestations might be required by different specific rule parts that have to be included also in those particular types of equipment authorization applications. Uh, block diagram must be included in the application we're starting to get into some of the really technical documents now at this point. This is mandatory for unlicensed devices under Part 15. It's optional for your licensed transmitters, uh, but it's very useful. And uh, oftentimes, you know, the, the FCC, if they have a question, they will come back and ask for a block diagram, even for the licensed devices as well, which, by the way, the FCC has the authority, of course, to, to ask for anything they want to ask for. Uh, to ensure that the device is actually compliant with their rules. So generally, we recommend that people just make it a habit to always include a block diagram. Uh, if you look at the actual rule that I specify there and that I quote there, you see that the FCC is really looking for a fair amount of detail in this block diagram, including, for example, showing the frequency of all of the clocks, oscillators, or crystals that might be included in the device, showing the different paths. What we're hoping to not see is Unfortunately, what a lot of people will try and submit is a single box that says TX, and, and that's the entire block diagram. And just obviously, there's not enough information there uh, for us to be able to use and help us, the TCB, to, to aid the TCB in the review and understanding what the device is. 
Uh, another document that's required of a technical nature is the operational description. This is not just uh, something that your, your marketing department puts out as an advertisement of the device, but we want to have some real information there. What is the intent of this device? If it has a radio involved in it, and that's why you're getting it certified, why is the radio used? What is the need for the radio to be used? How often is the radio used? What is its purpose? Uh, what kind of modulation are you using? Uh, is there a particular standard or is this a proprietary uh, operation that you're doing here? Uh, information about the antenna, the data rates, all of this type of information is really ideally what we're looking for in an operational description. Uh, some people will go kind of to the other extreme and submit a 140-page uh, detailed technical document about every chip that they've got in their device. That's also not what we need. That, that's kind of going too far in that, that way. It, a good operational description can be anywhere from you know, one to five pages long, uh, and uh, that, that should really have enough uh, detailed information for, for what we need in, in the process of doing an equipment authorization review. Uh, what I list here, again, are some of the requirements for uh, licensed devices, the rule parts that specify what's needed here in the operational description, and some of the information that we would be looking for inside that description. Schematics. Schematics are, are required for all transmitters, and that's, that's the bottom line. If you have an unintentional radiator, uh, like a computer or a peripheral that's uh, under Part 15, uh, or perhaps a Part 18 unintentional ISM device, you do not always have to submit schematics for those. But any type of transmitter that you've got, whether it's a Part 15 unlicensed or any other rule part licensed transmitter, you're going to need to submit the schematic diagrams for that. The parts list uh, is mandatory for licensed devices, licensed transmitters, that's uh, things like cell phones and uh, uh, tower mounted base stations and access points and things like that. A lot of the, well, access points could be unlicensed as well, I guess. But uh, um, parts list are required for those types of devices. The parts list is optional for a Part 15 unlicensed device. However, the FCC has stated that if the schematic diagram doesn't list the component values, then they would want to see the parts list that, that has those component values submitted along with it, even for a Part 15 device. So it's not a bad idea to, to include that in general. The tune-up procedure. Um, again, this is mandatory for all licensed devices, and uh, it's especially important also for any unlicensed devices that might require SAR testing. That's a type of RF exposure testing where it's very important to know what the uh, nominal target output power is for these devices as well as what the acceptable tolerance is. Uh, and so that's really the things that we're looking for when we say tune-up procedure. Uh, back in the day, you know, 1970s and before, uh, when these rules, a lot of these rules were first written, the tune-up procedure was really referring to uh, what you would go through at a broadcast, like an FM broadcast station or a television broadcast station, where it's an on-site uh, exercise in tuning the high-power transmitter up to the proper levels and settings. Um, that's not the case with most of these non-broadcast type devices these days. And so really what we're really looking for are particularly the, the nominal target output power levels and what the acceptable tolerance might be. The bottom line is we want to know what the worst case possible highest output power is that might possibly roll off of your assembly line. That's the value we're looking for because RF exposure in particular, uh, compliance with the RF exposure requirements must be demonstrated at that absolute worst case highest possible output power level. So that's why that information is particularly important. Photos, of course, are important to the device. External photos, both for unlicensed and licensed devices. I quote the particular rules here. Of course, uh, physical photos are no longer submitted. Uh, these are uh, only uh, PDFs uh, of photos. However, you gotta make sure that the quality of the PDF is still sufficient, the resolution is still sufficient, that the photos, the components on the boards can clearly be seen. The rule of thumb that the FCC always says is that you should be able to read what the chips say. When you've got a chip on your PC board and it's got printing on the chip, they want the photos of a high enough resolution that you can read what those chips say when you zoom in on them. 
uh, external and internal photos as well. And I was just referencing those with the, the quality that you want to be able to see as far as the chips. When it comes to the external photos also, it's important to note that the FCC ideally wants to see a photo showing every exterior side of the device. So for most devices, that's six photos showing all six sides of the device. Uh, that's what the FCC typically requires. Sometimes a single photo might be able to show two sides of the device, particularly if there's a, you know, nothing of interest and it's just a smooth side there, that might be possible, but uh, we want to be able to see every side of the device basically from every angle. On the internal side, I just mentioned we want to have a resolution that's uh, fine enough that we can uh, read, the, read the writing on the chips. Um, Another requirement for the internal photos is that a photo be provided showing both sides of every PC board uh, in your device. And if there's RF shielding there, then there should be two photos, one that shows the RF shielding in place. And this is also required, a second photo that shows the RF shielding removed. And the FCC does still specifically require that all of these photos be uh, included in the application. So if they're not there, the TCB uh, should be going back and asking you to provide additional photos uh, that do show all sides of both boards with shielding both in place and removed. For modular approvals, uh, you can still have an external photo if you want to submit that showing the shield in place, and then a lot of people will remove the shield and enter that as their internal photo exhibit, and that's fine. Uh, just a warning there with, with modular approvals, if you've got it sitting on a test jig, don't include the test jig in the photos because then that test jig becomes part of the certification. Everything you're showing in those photos, unless it's clearly marked with circles and arrows on the photo, uh, is considered to be part of the device being certified. Label is another important exhibit that you'll be required to submit. You must show both an example, uh, a photograph or a mechanical drawing of the label itself that you'll be placing on the device. You must also show and indicate where on your device, on the outside of your device, this label will be placed. And you can provide that, again, even showing where on your device it's going to be placed with a simple drawing, as long as it accurately indicates the side and location where it's going to be replaced. Uh, and this is something you might want to consider uh, if uh, you, you want to hold those photos, you know, uh, maybe short-term confidential. Photos of labels can never, or label location can never be held confidential, even short term. So if you don't want to give away the appearance of your device through the label location photo, uh, it, you, you might be well advised to instead provide a, a, just a nice drawing that kind of blankly shows the outlines of your device without any more detail than that, and then just indicates the location of the photo on it. Uh, the label itself, that's the label location, it must be visible. Uh, if you're going to put it in your battery compartment, then you can only do that if the device is shipped without a battery installed because uh, we want to make sure that at some point the user is guaranteed to see that label. And so if it's not on the exterior of the device but it's in the battery compartment, you can only do that if they are forced to open that battery compartment up to install the battery so that they are forced to see that label. And that, that is a requirement. Um, the label must be permanently fixed. You cannot attach your label to a, a removable battery compartment cover. That is not a legitimate place to put the label because you know, half of the remote controls in my house you know, have that missing and I've got a piece of tape holding the batteries in. So uh, you, you can't put your label there. In addition, the label uh, has to be, is expected by the rules to last the lifetime of the device. Uh, you can't use one, a cheap paper stick on label. It, it's got to be a, a, a real serious label and one of the things you should indicate in this exhibit is uh, you should indicate that indeed the label is expected to last the life of the device and uh, indicate how. You might say it's a, a certain material type of label attached with a permanent epoxy. And so just a simple sentence or two like that can then describe and, and affirm that the label is impermanent and describe how it's being permanently uh, attached to the device. Um, a little bit more detail on the requirement that uh, the, the, the information that has to be placed on the labels. This is one of the big ones for all Part 15 devices, 15.19A3. This is referred to as the two-part statement. So you, you'll hear a lot of times the FCC and other people refer to this as the two-part statement, obviously because of the one and two included in the statement here. If your device is too small and this won't fit on your label, 
uh, then you're allowed to put it in your user's manual. And the, and the rule of thumb that the FCC provides is if it's a handheld device, uh, you don't have to put this statement on the label. But if it's anything bigger than a handheld device, then there should be enough room for the statement to go on the device. And by the way, this statement here does not have to go on the same label that has the FCC ID number. They can be on separate labels on different places on the device, and that's acceptable as well. Um, both the FCC and Canada that we'll get to, they also allow electronic labeling where you can show the ID number there. Uh, one of the requirements there, uh, and uh, actually I didn't, I should have added that bullet here, but one of the requirements is that the device either has a screen on which this label can be electronically displayed or that it can only operate when it's directly connected to a device with a screen so that the ID labels can be shown on that screen that's connected to it. Uh, if you don't meet those two criteria, then you are not permitted to use electronic labeling and it must be a physical label on the device. I referenced the KDB publication here. I think I have a link for those in the back as well, uh, where you can get the FCC's uh, full uh, description of this requirement and of the, of the requirements uh, in place that allow electronic labeling to be used. There is going to be an RF exposure exhibit in your device. And uh, this is very important, uh, especially for devices slightly higher power, very low power type devices, which is a, some, not all, but a lot of Part 15 types of devices, particularly those devices where their limits are in terms of field strength dB microvolts per meter. And we're talking about things like under 15231 um, security remote control transmitters, key fob transmitters, garage door openers, um, uh, wireless phone, not, not, not cell phones, but the old, you know, just your little wireless phone in your house. That's your, that's your, you know, your landline wireless phone, uh, all types of remote control devices, things of that nature. Uh, typically, when the limit is, is, is written in terms of field strength in the FCC rules, most of those devices are operating at well under one milliwatt radiated power. And so in those cases, uh, for those very low power type devices, you generally do not even really have to address RF exposure uh, unless the FCC specifically comes back and requests that you do so for some particular reason, maybe because of a particular installation of your device or some such thing. Uh, I had a device, uh, for example, that I uh, the application for which I reviewed, and it was a uh, a body scanner, like at an airport, where you walk through like a metal detector kind of thing. Um, and that was actually being approved under Part 15. It was a very high frequency thing, but uh, because of the fact that it was focusing fields specifically on a person, that was its 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 whole purpose. The FCC did ask in that case that they address RF exposure, and it was able to comply pretty easily. Um, <clears throat> RF exposure very generally is divided into two basic categories. There's actually a third that I don't risk list here, but it can be lumped in with mobile, and that's uh, fixed devices, like tower-mounted or roof-mounted uh, antenna-type devices. Mobile devices are typically devices uh, that are going to be used at more than 20 centimeters from the human body, which is about 8 inches. Uh, so nothing handheld, nothing body-worn or anything like that, but things that might be sitting, for example, on your desk, like a wireless charger, or on the wall, like a, a Part 15, you know, a, a Wi-Fi access point, or something of that nature. Uh, these devices um, might or might not be categorically excluded from routine RF exposure evaluation. Uh, the, the requirements are listed there in the rules section that I, I put in parentheses, 2.1091. Um, most of these Part 15 devices and a lot of other devices are excluded. Uh, in that case, you can just use calculations to calculate the power density to show compliance with the maximum permitted exposure limits. If the device is not categorically excluded, and that's typically some of your more high power devices, uh, more than a one and a half or more than three watts ERP, that, that type of thing, uh, where those uh, power density values must actually be measured rather than simply calculated through simple equations. Um, if the device is portable, which means it's used <clears throat> excuse me, at distances closer than 20 centimeters to the body, uh, your cell phone, you know, your, your key fob transmitters, 
uh, any one of a number of different types of body-worn transmitters that are becoming more and more popular and prevalent today. Uh, these devices are considered portable. Uh, MPE is no longer applicable at closer than 20 centimeters. At that point, we've moved into the realm of SAR, specific absorption rates of the human body for these different types of RF uh, uh, frequencies. Uh, we're primarily looking at potential thermal cellular thermal damage uh, because of RF exposure, uh, you know, making sure you're not cooking yourself like a microwave oven uh, cooks things. Uh, SAR testing uh, can be very involved. It can be extremely expensive. Um, just so you know uh, up front, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very expensive, generally more expensive than EMC testing. Um, to give you all just a very rough idea, a brand new smartphone that has all the bells and whistles and operates and uh, cellular, PCS, AWS, LTE, and it's got uh, Wi-Fi, 5 gig and 2.4 gig, Bluetooth, Ant, RFID, all of these types of things that you'll find in a fully loaded smartphone. Uh, the testing for that, EMC and SAR together, can run you between you know fifty to a hundred thousand um, dollars at most test labs around the world. So uh, a big part of that, probably two thirds of that, would be the SAR costs. Um, a lot of SAR, a lot of times, SAR testing is not required, and the FCC specifies exclusions where you can avoid SAR testing based typically on your output power and how close the thing is used to your body. Uh, this is not an RF exposure uh, uh, talk, so I'm not going to go into any more detail, but I did want you all to know that these are a couple of important uh, types of exhibits that will be required in your application. Uh, then finally, we get to the test report itself. Uh, this is typically referring to the EMC, re EMC requirements rather than SAR or RF exposure. Uh, test report or multiple test reports are required in every application. Uh, they are required to show the device complies with the specific uh, requirements specified in the applicable FCC rule parts and rule sections. And I have here uh, the uh, a reference to the actual rule that shows the requirement that this test report be submitted. And the first note I have here uh, might seem kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised at how often um, it catches people by surprise. The applicant is responsible for everything in the test report, because a lot of times what happens is an applicant or a manufacturer will go to a test lab and hire the lab to put together a report, and they might hire the lab to act as their agent and submit the report and the rest of the application documentation to the TCB. Uh, and the lab might have not maybe made the applicant aware of all the details of what went on in the testing, or the applicant might not have taken it upon him or herself to go and look at what all those details are and what they're required to know about their device. Um, and so the FCC says, you know, we've got a complaint about your device. It's amazing how often they'll contact an applicant and the applicant will say, well, I didn't know my device did that. And it's because they were not aware of what went on during the testing and, and what the parameters were that were actually approved for that device. And so it's very important that an applicant or a manufacturer, you got it, you own it. <laughs> You've got to own that test report. You own all the results in it. They're all your responsibility and you're responsible for all of them. So it's really important that you are familiar with all of the results and, and the things that needed to be done during the testing, particularly if, for example, uh, in the laboratory, it's found that your device has to be modified in order to get it to pass certain requirements. Uh, you are on the hook then to ensure that whatever modification was implemented in that device in the lab in order to get it to pass, you're on the hook for ensuring that that same modification is then implemented in every single device that rolls off of your assembly line. Uh, and so it, that's another reason why it's very important that you be <clears throat> very familiar with everything that goes on during the testing in order to demonstrate the compliance of your product. Um, some of the information here that I have is the fact that when a TCB looks at this, it's not just an administrative review. This is a technical review on the part of the TCB. We're not only looking at the test data. We're not only looking to ensure that the tests were performed correctly and that the EUT, your device, was in the proper mode for that particular test. We look at all of those things. We look to see that it complies, but then we also look to see if the results 
uh, jive with the way that you've described your device. If the de- device, as described in the other documentation, uh, supports the results that we're seeing in the tests, in, in, in the test report. And so that it's very important to realize that there's got to be that type of cohesion throughout the entire application. Everything that you use to describe your device in the operational description and the block diagram has to be supported by and seen in the results of the tests. And the way that the EUT is set up to perform those tests has to be in accordance with the way it's described as operating in, in the other documentation. So you have to have that type of cohesion or consistency throughout the entire application. Uh, I'm going on to say the applicant is responsible for the content of the application, including the test results, because the device is going to be certified based on those values. And you want to make sure that as an applicant or the manufacturer, Uh, you are fully aware of the parameters to which your device was authorized because, again, you are on the hook for making sure that every device that comes off the assembly line uh, is abiding by and compliant with those precisely the same, those precisely the same parameters. When it comes to the review, just a a note, TCBs aren't perfect and, 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 you know, TCBs will occasionally miss things and uh, they might miss something in your report. They might not miss the fact that a setting was not quite in accordance with the procedure. Uh, So uh, this is, you know, generally one of the FCC's biggest complaints to the TCBs is uh, that we don't oftentimes fully examine all of these reports for common sense. In other words, uh, that the reports do what I mentioned earlier, that they support the way the device is described in the application um, and do not speak directly with the applicant. In other words, a lot of times what happens is the test lab or the agent, uh, TCB will normally work with them, but there are some things that we need to get information from directly from the applicant and, and cannot come from the agent. That has to do oftentimes with attestations. Uh, in other words, maybe your RF exposure compliance is completely based on the fact that you say, uh, we have hardwired into our device a maximum duty cycle of 50% and it is physically incapable and it can never be changed, and this is on every unit coming off of the assembly line, That's the, and, and based on that 50% duty cycle, your device complies maybe with RF exposure requirements. Uh, that's the type of information that would have to come directly from the applicant uh, It would in the form of like an assigned attestation. That's not something that, that can come necessarily from the agent in a case like that. And so the FCC would ask that we as a TCB do get something directly from the applicant for, for certain types of things like that, that really specifically uh, describe your device in some of these critical manners. And this is something that the FCC examines very closely when they go through an audited device, that, because uh, in a way they're not only auditing the device and the manufacturer or the applicant, but they're also auditing the TCB, of course, as well at the same time. And so uh, it's something that they will always look at very carefully. Something that goes along that supports the test reports are the test setup photos. And this is also a requirement. Uh, This has to be, you you can include these in your test report, but they must also be provided as a separate exhibit. The FCC uh, uh, system requires that they be a separate exhibit that is also uploaded. And of course, part of the reason is because you can get short-term confidentiality granted on test setup photos that show your device being tested, uh, but you cannot get that short-term confidentiality granted on the test report. And so that's why it kind of makes sense to pull your test setup photos out of the report, put them in a separate document, and then that separate document uh, may have short-term confidentiality afforded to it and not be released uh, for public consumption until uh, the device is actually being marketed or the short-term confidentiality period has expired. Um, These test setup photos that that you do submit really have to show every different test, have to show the configuration that was used for every different test that was performed. Uh, In other words, if some of the tests are performed maybe on an open area test site for radiated, some tests are performed for AC line conducted, hook up to a listen. Others are bench tests looking at you know, RF uh, conducted output measurements on a bench. Uh, if those are the different types of tests that are performed, there should be at least some tests of the RF radiated, some of the AC line conducted, and at least one test showing the device on the bench hooked up directly to a, to a spectrum analyzer, for example. 
We want to see photos of all the different configurations that were used. And we typically want to see uh, photos from different angles, front and back, that show clearly how the device was set up. If other devices or peripheral devices were attached to it during the testing, we want to make sure that those are clearly shown and that they are set up in accordance with the test procedures. So uh, these details should be, uh, these photos should be clear so they can provide all of these details uh, to the TCB when we're performing the reviews. Uh, finally, the user's manual, another important item that must be provided. It's mandatory for all types of applications. It has to contain all of the different required compliance statements. Uh, we'll, I'll list a few of those in just a moment. Uh, it must not include any misleading advice or information which conflicts with the details of the application. Uh, you can't submit an application that says, this device will never be used when worn on the body or held in the hand. It will only be used more than 20 centimeters from the person, and all of your RF exposure is based on that. And then we open up the user's manual, and it shows someone holding it in their hand. For handheld operation, do this. It, 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 then it's, we don't have consistency in the application at that point. Uh, and, and one of the main culprits for that incon inconsistency is always the user's manual. Uh, many times because the user's manual is not necessarily created by the technical people or the compliance people who are building the device and getting it, uh, getting the regulatory compliance approvals for it. A lot of times user's manuals are, 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 are created by uh, marketing people, public relations people, and uh, sometimes the lines of communication are not so good between those two groups. So you really want to make sure that that user's manual uh, is truly representative of your device. And it doesn't have to be a final manual that's submitted. It can be a draft manual, but it's got to have the, it cannot have incorrect information in there. It, it has to accurately describe your device, and everything in the application has to be supported by and also support the different usage configurations that are described in the user's manual. In other words, it's, it's the whole package. The manual is part of the application, and so there has to be consistency across every document, every exhibit within the uh, application itself. Uh, I go through and list here some of the different uh, statements that are typically required to be included in the user's manual, and you can look at these at your leisure. Uh, again, there's links for these things uh, at the end of this presentation. 1521, 15105, 1519. That 1519 is that two-part statement that we looked at earlier uh, that would go in the manual if it doesn't fit on your label. Um, RF exposure issues have to be addressed in the manual, particularly in the case of, uh, for example, a mobile device uh, that's used more than 20 centimeters from the body. If that's the way compliance was demonstrated as a mobile device at 20 centimeters or more from the body, then there has to be a statement in the manual that says something to the effect of, in order to comply with RF exposure requirements, this device must be used such that the radiating elements are always at least 20 centimeters away from any persons during normal operation. You've got to tell the user that they've got to keep that 20 centimeters away. If it ends up being a different distance, whatever that distance is, must be accurately reported to the user in this particular uh, RF exposure warning statement that goes in the manual. You're not required to put SAR levels into a manual, although certain other organizations uh, do require that. So if you are going to be putting things like SAR levels into your manual, you have to ensure that they are correct. Uh, the user's manual that you submit f uh, for a module, um, I, I think I mentioned this somewhere here, this, this is very possibly the most important document in the application for a module because uh, it should have a lot of detailed information on how the device has to be installed and what the installer's responsibilities are, uh, labeling their device, uh, spot check testing the device once they've installed the module. All of this information has to be provided in the installation guide, and the FCC has provided documents and KDBs publications that um, uh, very accurately uh, describe these requirements and in great detail. Uh, another thing that you have to describe if you have a modular approval and you're creating the installation manual for it is anything having to do with the antenna path. Uh, many times uh, there'll be an antenna trace design that must be part of, uh, detailed in part of the application because it has to show how the uh, trace goes from where the transmitter output is across the PC board to wherever the antenna is or the antenna connector is. 
And so that antenna trace that goes between those two points must also be detailed. And if the installer changes that, then it's going to trigger additional testing and a potential uh, class two permissive change application from, from the uh, module holder or in the case of a change in ID, the, the new grant holder. So these are all uh, critical uh, bits of information that have to be included in that installation manual for a module. Um, moving on now, I think we've got a few minutes left uh, for Canada. Um, uh, certification in Canada is uh, separate and different than the United States. Uh, it's a separate application, separate forms that have to be filled out. Um, some of the documentation is different, but the, really the majority of the documentation is the same. So most of the things that we just went through for the FCC are applicable to Canada as well. Uh, I highlighted a few things on the following slides uh, that are different, where, where, where Canada, where I said is a little bit different. They have some different forms that get filled out. Uh, there's the RSP 100 form. As a matter of fact, they have several more forms that you fill out than the FCC. Um, another difference is that uh, when a TCB submits the uh, grants and application and then uploads it to the FCC, the FCC audits probably 5 to 10 percent of all of the applications that TCBs grant because that's just the volume that gets granted versus the manpower that the FCC has to do it. On the other hand, because far fewer grants are issued for Canada, I said, which is the equivalent of the FCC in Canada, they audit 100 percent of the applications that the CB submit. So everything that a CB does for Canada goes through, they submit it to Canada. Canada looks over all of those things before they list the device on the, their, their REL, REL, the radio equipment list, uh, which is what makes the device legal for sale or marketing in Canada. Uh, if they find mistakes, they pass the application back to the CB. The CB has to either correct them or go back to the applicant uh, to, to correct whatever the errors might be. Uh, this includes correcting the, the information on the forms. Uh, everybody involved has to be registered with ISED, the applicant, the agent, the test lab, and the Canadian representative. Uh, when you uh, register with ISED, you will get uh, ID numbers, and you have to inf provide information about your location, your address, and things of that nature. When you fill out the forms, everything on the forms has to match everything in the Canadian database. Uh, especially when it comes to addresses, email addresses, and things of that nature. Everything's got to match. Uh, Canada has, in addition to the ICID number, which is kind of similar to an FCC ID number, they have a couple of other things. They have a PMN, which is the product marketing name. Uh, this is the name by which you market your device. Uh, it, you might have a, a model number for it. It might be the XYZ ABC, but everybody calls it the Thunderbolt or whatever the name might be. That Thunderbolt would be your product marketing name. You must also report that to Canada. The HVIN, the hardware version number, is uh, what they used to call just say the model name or the model number, but uh, that became difficult for some applicants for marketing reasons and things of that nature, so they created a separate animal called the HVIN. But for most people, they just make it equivalent to their model name or model number. But these are things uh, that, that I said tracks uh, the FCC, for example, does not track model numbers under a single FCC ID number. Uh, as long as all the different models are electrically identical to the one which obtained the FCC ID number, uh, they can all bear that same FCC ID number. Canada, on the other hand, will track individual models by this H of N under, it, it, within a single ICED ID number or ICID number. The types of equipment that we fill out for Canada is actually a lot simpler than the FCC's equipment classes. Uh, words like Bluetooth device, I and mean, they make it very clear what the device is. Uh, I mentioned here uh, there's a macro in ACB's application form. And I should have mentioned earlier that uh, uh, my company, ACB, if you go to our website, we have a lot of documentation and forms for these different types of uh, applications and things and lists of everything that you need to fill them out. All of that's uh, available on the website for free uh, to anybody, so you can go there and take a look at any of these things. Uh, one of the things there in the Canadian form is the macro that shows all of the different, for example, uh, types of equipment class that ISET has. Uh, you'll have to def uh, define the test site and the open area test site number, which again comes from the fact that the lab has registered itself with Canada as well. 
And so they have a number that has to be included in your application, as well as the name and address of the test lab or labs. If you've used more than one, then all of them have to be identified. You might have one EMC lab, one SAR lab, and you would have to list both of them. Some of the technical information that, that Canada requires is they always require an occupied bandwidth measurement or calculation of necessary bandwidth for every single transmitter. The FCC typically only requires this for the most part for licensed transmitters uh, where there are limits on occupied bandwidth, especially for channelized services. And because that occupied bandwidth, which is the 99% power bandwidth, is the value that's used when you create the emission designator for a transmitter, for a particular emission from a transmitter. Uh, I said requires the emission designator for all transmitters, including unlicensed Part 15 ones, you know, like Part 15 that the FCC does not. And so they always require an occupied bandwidth power measurement. Uh, potentially, you could do a necessary bandwidth calculation uh, that's typically easy if it's maybe classic FM or AM, but for most digital types of formats, uh, rather than figuring out the math, it's far easier to just do an occupied bandwidth measurement and use that value. Uh, listing the type of modulation, uh, typically we want to look at the actual type of modulation, like uh, Gaussian mean shift key, GMSK or QPSK, and not just frequency hopping spread spectrum or Bluetooth or something like that, where generally we need a little bit more detail than that. Uh, but they do allow for some flexibility in this, and, and they have not been coming down too hard on that as long as you're providing uh, accurate information. You're also required to submit worst-case spurious emission levels, uh, which, again, is something that the FCC does not require. Uh, and the Canada, uh, I said, defines the worst case as being that which is closest to the limit, which is not necessarily the highest level across the board, but rather the one that is closest to the limit. And uh, there must be a signature there. Uh, they have a lot of the same requirements for cover letters. I see we're running over, so I'm going to try and speed this up. Um, uh, an additional letter that Canada does require is a letter from a Canadian representative, somebody in Canada that will represent this device before the Canadian government. And there are Canadian firms that offer that service. Uh, if the company that's uh, um, filing for authorization is a Canadian company already in Canada, then they don't need to have that. Labeling requirements here, these are very kind of similar to the FCC requirements, uh, except that there's additional information required. There's the ICID number, but then there's also the HVIN or model number that must be included on the label. Uh, the product marketing name might be on the label, but that can also be included in the user's manual. The user's manual information that I list here references the rule part where you can find it. Uh, one thing of note is that the information, all the regulatory information in the user's manual for Canada must be provided both in English and in French. Uh, if you only have it in English at the time of the equipment authorization, that's okay, but then you would need to submit an attestation that says by the time we actually market this device, we will also have all of this information in French and that will be provided as well. RF exposure is similar to the FCC. Uh, there's several forms that you have to fill out at Annex A, B, or an Annex C, depending on whether or not you meet certain uh, exemption thresholds that the that I said specifies in their standard RSS-102, which is their RF exposure standard. The test reports for Canada, uh, for the FCC, we needed a different test report for each equipment class. Here in Canada, we need a different test report for each RSS, each radio specification standard, which are the different standards under which uh, they authorize devices, similar to the different rule sections that the FCC has. Um, if you're using a FCC test report that does not already reference the applicable ICED RSS standard sections, you can provide a separate cross-reference table that says this particular data for the FCC report shows compliance with this particular RSS standard. Uh, they have accepted that in the past, but they have also mentioned that they would like to move away from this. Uh, the better way to do it is simply to make sure that the test report references both the FCC requirements as well as the Canadian requirements also. Uh, 
Finally, uh, there's different types of applications that can be submitted both to the U.S. or Canada. There's new certifications. The ICED also has the new family in addition to family, and that has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, they also track model numbers or HVNs, permissive changes or change in ID and multiple listings. Uh, quickly, some of the common mistakes we see has to do with the quality of the documents, block diagrams not listing all of their crystal or oscillator or clock frequencies, operational descriptions not really explaining the device, maybe just as advertising features, but no technical capabilities. Uh, the installation manual for the module is just missing all of the required installation information. These are all things that we see as problems regularly. The other big mistake that we see, and I've been mentioning this throughout this talk, is consistency. We want to make sure that there is consistency across every exhibit in the application with regards to the modes in which the device can operate, the power levels at which it operates, when it transmits, when it doesn't transmit, the configurations in which it, in which it can be operated. All of these things have to be consistent across the entire application. If they're not, the TCB has to go back or the CB has to go back and ask for, for you to reconcile this information so there's no discrepancy in the application that we eventually upload to the regulatory website. And that's it. Uh, I ran over a few minutes. I apologize for that. I uh, tried to go over and, and provide you all with as much information as I could on a very basic and general level on the needs of, of, uh, of an application. Uh, when you submit an application for certification for FCC uh, or for ISET in Canada, uh, I've got the contact information here where you can reach me. Here are some of the links that I mentioned for FCC rule parts. I've got a couple of different links there. One is an FCC link, and the other is outside of the FCC, which sometimes works better. Uh, the KDB publications I have there, then the Canadian radio standards and procedures are all there as well. And at the bottom, of course, you can see the uh, ACB website link, uh, and that's where if you go there and go under documentation, you can find that we provide a lot of different documents and instruction on how to fill them out, what documents are necessary, and all that type of information is located there. Uh, for you for free. Um, Kim, that pretty much uh, finishes it up. I don't know if there's uh, at this point any questions or... Well, thank you, Greg, for such a wonderful presentation. There are a, quite a few questions, so I know we won't get to them today. I'm not sure if you want to answer maybe one or two. I do see your email is there, so if we don't get to your question or we don't ask extra question, please go ahead. I guess, Greg, it's okay for them to shoot you an email sure. um, to ask a question? Yep. Uh, just if you send me an email, just specifically say that uh, you know that that you were listening in on this webinar. It has to do a question pertaining to this webinar, and I'll be more than happy to answer it. But uh, yeah, I could probably take a couple right now if you like. Okay, I'll go ahead and just select two quickly. Um, the first one, I will. What's the meaning of license and non-licensed devices here? Oh, very good question. Um, a licensed or an unlicensed device. Typically, this refers to transmitters. Okay, by definition, non-transmitters, things like digital devices, computers, those are unlicensed. But a transmitter can be licensed or unlicensed. And what that means is once you've authorized the equipment, certain types of devices require site licensing. In other words, a broadcast transmitter that's transmitting an FM radio station or a TV station or um, you know, some of the uh, microwave links that banks use to transmit data. These are, are, are licensed devices because in addition to the equipment authorization, when they install that equipment in a particular site, they have to go to the FCC and get a license for that site. The licensing process uh, is something that will give them, for example, a call sign. And so, you know, WHFS is, is a radio call sign. All licensed stations will get a call sign. Uh, many of them aren't public radio stations, so they don't advertise them necessarily, but uh, this means that in the part of the licensing process, uh, the users are also tested to ensure that they have knowledge about how to use the equipment in a compliant manner. Typically, licensed devices are higher power devices. Unlicensed devices, unlicensed transmitters are authorized under Part 15 of the rules. This includes your key fob transmitter, um, RFID, Wi-Fi, as a matter of fact, is unlicensed. Uh, uh, Bluetooth, Zigbee, 
all of these things are much lower power types of devices. Once you have an equipment authorization for an unlicensed transmitter, then you can sell it and anybody can use it within the bounds of the equipment authorization parameters. Uh, you don't need to get a license in order to use the key fob transmitter on your keychain to unlock and lock your car. You, you as a user do not have to obtain a license. And so that is considered an unlicensed device. So typically unlicensed devices are much lower power. And once the equipment authorization has been issued, then anybody can use it as long as they're using it within the parameters specified in their equipment authorization. Licensed devices typically are higher power devices uh, and entail the requirement that the user obtain or the user or the site obtain a license from the FCC, which is an additional level of authorization. Your cell phone is a combination of licensed and unlicensed transmitters. You've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in your cell phone, and these are unlicensed. You don't need a license to use it. It's free to use. The unlicensed devices are free to use. Wi-Fi is free. If, there's, if you've got an AP a, a access point, it's free to use. Licensed transmitters, on the other hand, you pay to use those. And that's like your Part 22, 24 cellular, GSM, um, CDMA, LTE uh, types devices. Uh, these are higher power devices. This is what actually allows your phone to talk to the cell tower and from there to connect to other cell towers or the internet or whatever the case might be. So uh, those higher power transmitters in your phone are licensed. Now you as the user, uh, even though it's a licensed transmitter, you as the user do not have to get an individual, an, you do not have to get an individual license because it is covered by the license of the carrier. So the carrier, if you have Verizon or AT&T or Sprint, that carrier has gotten a license for each of the towers that it operates, and they have a blanket license that covers the license transmitter in your phone. So when you're using a license transmitter from your phone, you're paying for it. Unlicensed stuff, though, like the Wi-Fi, that's free. Uh, typically, like I said, much lower power, much more local uh, in nature. So that, that's the basic difference between the two. All right, I'm going to ask one more. I'm just choosing randomly here. Um, what is the difference between permissive class one versus class two? Okay, good question. Again, these are some of the details we just didn't have the time to get into uh, in this discussion today. But uh, if you already have a certification and uh, you've gotten your device certified and you're, you're, you're selling it and life is good, and uh, your engineers come to you and say, you know what, we've made some revs to the board inside here, and it's going to fit in a little bit better, and it'll be a little bit easier for us to produce them. Uh, so we're going to make some slight changes to the board, and some modifications that might potentially affect the transmitter, which you've gotten certified in there. Uh, certain types of changes that are made are, are, are permitted under that original FCC ID number. You could never increase your power under an ID number. If you want to increase power because you want to have more power to get you know, more range, you're going to have to recertify that new to higher power device under a different FCC ID number. But there are certain changes you can make and still keep your original ID number. If you're just relaying out your, your board to make it uh, run through production better, uh, that's the type of thing that, that can be done, and typically you will be able to keep your ID number. Now, what you would usually do in a situation like that is you would have the device tested, whether you have maybe an in-house capability to do that or you would take it to a lab, a third-party lab. You, you got your new laid out PC board, you take that and have them test it. You then compare those results to the original results. If the, same, if the results are the same or if it's even quieter than it was before, then that's considered a class one permissive change. You do not have to submit that information to the TCB or the FCC. All you have to do is clearly document it all, what the change is, what your results are that show that the change has not affected your results, and you keep all of that on file because you may be called upon at some point in the future to produce that if the FCC wants to look at it. But at the time when you do it, there's no submittal to the TCB. It's, it's, as soon as you're done with the testing, you look at it, the results are all good, that's your class one change. You can go ahead and implement that change and start using the new board. On the other hand, if you take it to be tested and you say, well, it still passes, but you know, a couple of those spurious emissions are 
a few, three or four dB higher. Now they're a lot closer to the limit than they used to be. That's the situation where that would be considered a class two permissive change. A class two permissive change has in some way degraded the original results that were submitted. And so now you have to have a new test report. And at this point, then, you would have to go to an actual certified and recognized 17 or 25 certified test lab and have them do a new set of tests on your modified device. Uh, and then you would support, submit that as part of a class two permissive change application. The difference is a class two permissive change must be submitted to the TCB, who then reviews it, approves it, uh, and issues you a class two permissive change grant, which then allows you to market your device both under the original grant, if you choose, without the modifications, and then in addition to that, also under the new class two permissive change grant that covers those modifications. And so you have the option then at that point. But the difference between the class one and the class two change is the class one change has no effect or a positive effect on the uh, emissions of, of the, orig the originally reported emissions, and so there's no submittal to the TCB. A class two change has had some negative effect on the emissions. It still complies, but maybe it's a little bit closer to the limit now than it used to be. In that case, you must submit that as an application to the TCB. They will review it and issue a class two permissive change grant. Now, in that class two permissive change application, you're only required to submit documents that have changed from the original. So if the external photos are exactly the same, you don't need new external photos, but you've relayed out your board, so you will need new internal photos showing the new laid out boards. If the schematics or the block diagram, if those things are exactly the same, you do not have to submit those with the class two permissive change. So many times a class two permissive change might not have any confidentiality requests because none of the confidential information has changed. It might be just some new photos and a new test report to cover that particular change. But that's the difference between a class one permissive change, no submittal to the TCB, versus a class two change, a submittal to the TCB and eventually receiving a class two permissive change grant. Okay? All right, thank you, Greg. Again, his email is there. I know I didn't get to everybody's question, um, but please, you can send it to his email right there that you see on the screen. And uh, thanks do go to Greg Schumach for taking time out to enlighten us about preparing certification applications for radio approvals. Our next upcoming webinar is covering over-the-air testing method for RED, coexistence, and EEM interference presented by Roden Swartz actually a week from today, May 28th, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you haven't already done so, make sure you visit our website to register for this webinar if you're interested. On behalf of the Washington Labs Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. I will now end the event and enjoy the rest of your day, and please be safe. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.